Before I dive into my lesson, because this will be the last time that I address the congregation, uh, I'd like to express my thanks for the congregation for having us here. Uh, I'm thankful that my family was able to join me with, uh, with me on this trip. My kids are homeschooled, and so that gives us the flexibility to, uh, for the kids to come with us, and that was part of the part of the reason that we decided to homeschool. And of course, I'm thankful for my wife and her absolute patience with me and the kids. She did some homeschooling there in the hotel room, and I can tell you that's not a, an easy feat. Uh, and so I appreciate her uh, and her efforts everywhere we go. I appreciate Luke and his efforts uh, here in this congregation, and I'd like to recommend that you hold him up and esteem him and help him along as he goes through and tries to do the work here in this area. It's not easy being an evangelist, it's not easy being a young evangelist, and it's not easy to be in a new area. Uh, and so I highly recommend him. I've known him for a few years, and I, I highly recommend him and his efforts. And so please continue to encourage him and strengthen him. You never know how much a kind word of appreciation goes. So please remember that as you go forward. I'm thankful to see everyone that's made the effort. I've never been here on a Sunday morning. When we lived here in Kentucky, we lived here for almost 10 years. Uh, I worked at Lexington for about a year, year and a half, and then we moved down to Walnut Grove, and we were there for about eight. Um, and uh, I preached here on, I believe it was the second Wednesday night of every month. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so I've never been here on a Sunday morning. It's good to see everyone that is here. Uh, and of course, there's some faces that are missing, some new faces from the last time we were here over four years ago or just about four years ago. Uh, but that being the case, let's just get right into our lesson. Here in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus, of course, is explaining to the folks of this time something that is still so heavily applicable 2,000 years later. He says, don't worry about the simple things in life. He makes comparison to the lilies of the field. He makes comparison to the birds of the air. He makes comparison to how they have what they need and they don't have to go to work in the morning. They don't have to go to the store to buy their clothes or to make their clothes. They don't have to worry about those things. He says they're arrayed just like or even better than Solomon with all of his wisdom and all of his money. And so you think about that and that comparison and Jesus really puts life into perspective to say, listen, they're not worth worrying about. We'll talk about our needs later on. But here he says in verse 33, he makes this contrast when he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and these things will be added to you. He makes a number of promises, or he makes a promise here. But first, before he does, he says, you must seek first the kingdom of God and his promises. You know, a lot of times, whenever we consider religion and we consider uh, our devotion to the church and our devotion to the kingdom, our devotion to seeking God and his righteousness and who he is and being godly, and whatever that means, as we'll talk about, Whenever we think about that, sometimes we hear this phrase, you take religion too seriously. And I think that's one of the most interesting and weird comparisons and maybe even slights I've ever heard, let alone to hear it from a Christian. You take your religion, you take the church, you take this all too seriously. Well, folks, I'd like to make a proposition today. There's nothing more in this world to take seriously more than the church and seeking God and his righteousness. There's a lot of things to figure in this world. There's a lot of things to do in this world. There's a billion distractions. There's a billion things to be after and seeking after and finding. But there's nothing more precious than Christ and his kingdom. So let's just first consider what is the nature of this kingdom. If we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, what is this kingdom? 
What is it that we're supposed to be looking for? My children kind of get irritated when I bring them up in lessons, so I ask for their pardon. Sometimes we'll tell our kids to go look for something. We'll say, go to your room and look for this or that. And they go and they disappear for five or ten minutes. And then they yell down the stairs, what am I supposed to be looking for? Aren't we all like that? Don't we all do that kind of thing? What am I supposed to be looking for? Well, let's just kind of consider if Jesus is going to give this uh, command that we're to seek first the kingdom of God, what are we supposed to be looking for? Well, first off, his people or his audience that he's speaking to would know entirely what he's trying to talk about. Not only do they know about the kingdom, they know that they're supposed to be looking for this type of thing. Number one, in Romans chapter 14 and verse 17, he says, Paul says, that it is not something that you're going to go and just grasp and take hold of and go scan it at the checkout counter and take it home with you. It's also not something that's going to be something that is so tangible and passing that he says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink or eat and drinking. It's not food. It's not the simplicities of this and now and you eat it and it's gone. He says it is not the meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You know what we find is that all of these things that whenever Jesus says, go and seek these, be these, they're intangibles. You read, blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are, the, uh, uh, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And you read all of those. And he says all of these attributes, they're not something that you can go and buy. They're something you develop. And so when he says, seek the kingdom of God, it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Jesus says that the kingdom is not of this world. That doesn't mean we're supposed to fly to Mars to find it. It means it's not something that is right here, like the kingdom of Rome or the kingdom of the Medes or Persians or America or Germany or Russia. John 18, verse 36, Jesus just almost passingly when he's addressing Pilate, says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, would my, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from here or from hence. He says, it's not something you're going to go find. Don't worry, Pilate. I'm not trying to set up some kind of kingdom that's going to fight you and Caesar. Don't worry about that. My kingdom is not that kind. <laughs> because the kingdom of God is within us. Luke 17 and verse 21. Neither, he says, shall they say, lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. At risk of way oversimplifying the kingdom... The kingdom of God is those of God's people. Today, to be in the kingdom, you must be in the church. And the kingdom and the church are essentially interchangeable. Whenever we read through the scriptures and you read about the kingdom and the church, he's not talking about 2,000 years, 10,000 years in the future, he's going to establish a kingdom. He says, it's here. It is at hand you can almost find it right now, Jesus says. Well, now it's here. Now it's here. It is the church. Because you cannot be a part of the kingdom and not be a part of the church. They are inseparable, if you will. So how do we seek it first? If we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, how do we do that? Again, Sometimes we're told some great advice, but we don't know how to carry it out. It's kind of like being told a piece of information. You need to go down the road, and you need to go do that, and you need to fix this. Okay, that's great. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to carry out that command. 
So how do we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Job expresses this in Job 23 and verse 12. Now, Job is pleading with his friends. And he says, now, have I gone back from the commandment of his lips? Neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. Excuse me. I have esteemed the words of his mouth, God's words, of his mouth more than my necessary food. You know what he says there? He says, I would rather, and I do rather, try to find what God has to say more than I care about my breakfast and my bread at lunch and a supper time meal. I care about it more than the things that keep me alive. And that's not to say that Job is just trying to wait for some kind of revelation. We today, of course, have the word of God in a printed form. And we have the ability to sit down and read through the nighttime watches. And we can sit and we can study the word of God. And he says, I esteem that more than my food. Turn with me to Romans 12. I know many of us have this verse kept in our hearts. Romans 12 and verse 1 and 2. You know, this is one of those verses that we could very easily read, memorize, but not really put to heart into practice. I beseech you. That word beseech almost means beg. I beg you, brethren. Therefore, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He says, <clears throat> this is rational for you. It's not beyond the means of what God has asked. For him to ask you to be the sacrifice. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought in great detail about all of the thousands, millions of animals that were sacrificed in the tabernacle, in the temple, throughout the years, throughout the millennia, by God's people. I don't know if you've ever considered the sacrifice that was required of them. They didn't just cut them and say, okay, I'll gather a cup of blood and then you can go on your merry way. No, their life was ended. And while that animal may not have recognized the great sacrifice they were about to make and what it meant, here he says, you can. That's not to say we're to kill ourselves. That's not to say that we are to seek out death for Christ. It means we can die for Christ. But more importantly, he says, serve God with all of you. All of you. That being the case, he's asking a lot. He's asking more than just Give up an hour on Sunday, an hour and a half on Sunday when the weather's perfect, and you could be out fishing. That's wonderful, and I'm glad that you're here. But it's more than that. In our reading, in Matthew chapter 6, he says, Don't worry about the things of the world or even our necessities, but be anxious. Work for the things of God. It's very comparable to Philippians 4 and verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Be that concerned about the kingdom of God. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 29 and 30, we may even have to make personal and relationship sacrifices to put the kingdom of God first. 
Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, and the Gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now, in this time, houses, brethren, sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, and persecutions, in the world to come, eternal life. Sometimes we have to make sacrifices for Christ's kingdom. And unfortunately, sometimes we see the church and we see Christ's kingdom as if it's the Rotary Club or some fishing club or some kind of quilting bee that, I mean, if we don't do anything for it, then big deal. I'd like to be there. I'd like to help. But, I mean, if you look at my schedule, You'd understand. How do we seek God's kingdom or the kingdom and God's righteousness? Number one, as we consider the fact that we are to seek not only the kingdom, but even God's righteousness first. We are to seek his attributes of righteousness first. What that means is that not only are we a citizen of this kingdom, but we are being trying to be as close to what God is as well in his attributes of righteousness. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Here he says, now it's almost as if Paul is sitting down here in Mount Vernon, Kentucky in 2024 and looking at this world and he says, you are to be righteous in this crooked and perverse generation or nation or land or time. Does that not sound like our time? He says, I don't care what everyone else is doing. I don't care what everyone's standard of righteousness is. I don't care what everyone else's standard of what is being devoted is. Seek first the kingdom of God. Put his kingdom first and his righteousness. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, Jesus says, be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. This is seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is how you seek his righteousness. Now, we look at the word perfect and we become intimidated. We say, ah, I can't be perfect. Rather, it means complete, mature. Now, that's not to lessen the importance of it. It's not to lessen the gravity of our, the task at hand. We are to seek to be like God in this world. So are we seeking the kingdom of God first? You know this word first means exactly what you think it is. Primarily. Before everything else. Above all else. In exchange of some things. Are we seeking the kingdom of God first, the righteousness of God first, above all else, before everything else, or is our job, our hobbies, our family, our farm, our fishing, our hobbies, or uh, all of the things that we have to do, the sleep that we want to get, our entertainment above God and his kingdom? What is first? Now, if you were to ask someone to make a list, make a list of what's most important in their life, they'd probably say, you know, my family's very important in my life, and uh, my job's important, and I, I like this house, and I like to keep it up. And you were to say, what about the church? Oh, yeah, 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 that's number one. And why is it an afterthought? Why is it so frequently in our lives that whenever it comes to the church, we say, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do that too. And I'll tell you, I mean, it is my 
livelihood to go and preach the gospel. And sometimes we have this view of evangelists, of preachers, that all they ever think about is the church. And I have to admit that a lot of times that's, that's what I'm thinking about. But that's not the only thing we ever think about. And I have to correct myself sometime to say, no, what is first in my life? I love my children. I love my wife. I love having a place to sleep at night. I love having a job. But most importantly, the kingdom of God should be first, primarily above all else, even by the exclusion of other things. In Matthew 6 and verse 19 through 21, Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures in, upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where we spend our time and our effort is where our heart is placed. That might be family, it may be money, hunting, fishing, spending time with friends, and so many other activities and things. But where does the church fit in our lives? Is it extracurricular or is it primary in our lives? And we have to be very introspective to say, where does it fit? And I don't just mean about attending services because the church is more than just going to church. The church is more than just sitting in a pew. The church is more than just showing up. As wonderful as those things are, are we concerned about the growth of the church? Are we concerned if the church is growing in number and contributing to that? Are we helping along that effort and having an evangelistic mindset to say, I want to bring others to Christ. And you may say, well, I'm not an evangelist. You don't have to be. You can talk to Christ even without being an elder, a deacon, a teacher, a preacher. You can talk to someone and say, we're having a gospel meeting down at the church. We'd love to have you. When someone comes to you and asks a question about religion, what an awesome opportunity you've been extended. Are we concerned if the church is growing in strength, in unity, in love? Do we work on ourselves to make sure the church grows and has a future? Now, we always focus on Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25. Let us consider one another to provoke and love good and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We have a responsibility and command to come together at least on the first day of the week so we may encourage each other to be Christians the rest of the week and to commune together, remembering the Lord's death. If we've missed a service of the Lord's day morning for frivolous reasons, we have sinned and need to be reconciled with God. Now, I travel the country, and I don't do it extensively, but I travel the country, and I've seen congregations, and I've worked with congregations, and I've seen Wednesday night crowds, and I've seen meeting crowds that have diminished all the way across the board, not just here, not just in a, a, a certain congregation, but across the board. And we have to ask ourselves, why? And trust me, I get it. I have, I recognize, to many of you, I'm just some strange preacher that flew in by night, and here I am on a Sunday morning preaching on something you've heard a billion times. I get that. But there's a reason that it's preached on. The reason it's preached on is because it's a great symptom of spiritual detriment. And lack of development are we concerned about the growth of the church if we're missing a Wednesday night or a gospel meeting 
because we don't have to be there, is the quote I hear. Because we don't have to be there. Are we seeking the kingdom of God first? Let's not even talk about whether it's a sin. Let's just consider, are we seeking first the kingdom of God? And can we profess that we are hungry and thirsty after righteousness? If we are extended an opportunity to serve God, to study the word of God, to spend time together as Christians and say, I mean, it's not necessary, is it? Is it required? Or is it just good? Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It's not just a matter of existing as a Christian, but that we are diligently seeking God. Never in the history of mankind has God sought to be looked after as an extracurricular activity. Never in the history of God has God been sought or has God sought to be looked at and looked for frivolously and I'll do the least I can why do we seek first the kingdom of God why why does it even matter it's not just about so the preacher will leave me alone it's not just so that guy will stop asking me where I was and stop calling me There was a brother when I worked here in Kentucky. He's passed away now. But he missed a number of services, so I gave him a call. I couldn't, I couldn't visit him at home. and I gave him a call. I said, hey, this is Zach Evans from down there at Walnut Grove at church. And he said, Zach, I know why you're calling. I haven't been there. I need to be there. Don't waste your time. I was kind of thrown off. I mean, you have your whole spiel all planned out of what you're going to talk about, and that wasn't where I was going to go first. <clears throat> I wanted to see how he was doing and how the family was and if he was okay and if there was anything I could do for him. And I kind of respected that he, he didn't pull any punches. He just went right to it. He said, you know, I know I need to be there. The next Sunday morning, he was there. You see... It's not just about so the preacher will leave you alone. It's not just about so someone will leave you alone and stop asking where you were. The reason they ask is because they're concerned. It's also because seeking first the kingdom of God is what God has required. It's valuable. The kingdom of God is valuable beyond measure. And I believe, I wholeheartedly believe that if the, re the reason that we don't Fully seek the kingdom of God. And I don't just mean, I want, to, I want to make sure this is clear. It's not just about attending services. It's about seeking all of it. Making sure we spend time studying and spending time together. And to growing as a Christian. And telling others about Christ. And sure, attending services as well we should. It's not just about one part. It's about the whole. Are we Fully seeking God with every fiber of our being. And I recognize that some people are sick and unwell and cannot travel at night. And, and I recognize all of those things. If you're sick, I don't want what you got. I get that. But do we truly see the value of the kingdom? And Matthew 13 and verse 44 through 46. And the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. He sold everything so he could buy that one thing. 
Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man, seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found that one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. I don't know if you know much about diversity diversification and about uh, investing but the number one thing they say is do not just buy one stock these people said now this is more valuable than anything do we see the value of the kingdom just as these folks saw the value of the kingdom that's not saying we have to sell our house and get rid of our family and kick our dog to the curb and forget everything else in this world. It's not to say that you should never turn on a television again in your life. It's not to say that you can never have fun again in your life. It's to say, what is first? Are we as obsessed with the kingdom as these folks are? Because I can guarantee you it's worth the effort and the sacrifice. Also, the kingdom of God is important because salvation is found therein. 1 John 2, and verse 16 and 17. Of course, he says, for all that is in the world, excuse me, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of the Father or God, abideth forever. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, and verse 6 and 7. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Why do we seek first the kingdom of God? Because it's of God. Because it is from God. Because salvation is found therein. You can't find salvation at the racetrack. You can't find, find salvation in a television box. You can't find salvation at a quilting bee or fishing or all of those things. None of which are sins. They're problems that can be hindrances to seeking first the kingdom of God. It's all about perspective and priority. Here are some promises. If we seek first the kingdom of God, you know I recognize we're humans and a lot of times we say, what's in it for me? Perhaps that's not the right attitude, but let's just consider it. What's in it for me? In our reading, all the necessities will be added to those who seek first the kingdom of God. We, have, we may not have everything we want and desire, but everything we need. David says in Psalm 37, verse 25, I have been young and now am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Psalm 34 and verse 10. The lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. You see, a lot of times, even if we are in want or need, we have brothers and sisters that help take care of us and assist us and build each other up. But if we only show up, and I don't just mean to services, just show up in each other's lives when we need something. People are hesitant to help. You see, though, there has to be a division between what we want and what we need. If you were to ask a teenager, if you're a teenager here, I'm sorry to hurt your feelings. If you were to ask a teenager what they need, they'd probably say food and clothes and a house a cell phone, an internet, a TV, and some kind of entertainment, and my school books, and a billion other things, because we sometimes forget what is need. You see, in the first century, in the eastern part of the world, the two things you needed was food and clothes. You didn't even have to have a house. <laughs> food and raiment. Clothes. 
And here we think in our day and age, well, I've got to have my cell phone for work. And I've got to have the internet because, I, I mean, can you think about how boring this life is without that? I've got to have my books because I've got to have something to do. I've got to have my TV because I love American Idol and 48,000 other shows. I've got to have my nice house with air conditioning and heating and cooling and all of those things. I've got to have my refrigerator. And our list just grows and expounds and, and continues to grow. Throwing out everything that we don't need, and I mean to get from today until 24 hours from now. That's what Jesus means. I've heard folks use this verse to say, you'll have everything. No, you won't have everything. As if Christ is saying, if you obey me, you'll have a wonderful land and you'll have a, a wonderful house. Jesus didn't even have a place to sleep sometimes. Why is he promising it to us? Most importantly, even if and when our lives end, if we put God's kingdom and his righteousness first, we will be rewarded with the comfort and bliss of a home in heaven. More than just having bread to get from today to tomorrow. More than just having clothes, and I don't mean a whole closet full, I mean to get, get you covered from today to tomorrow. Jesus says, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, these things, the simplicities, the basics of life will be, be added to you. Seeking first the kingdom of God takes deliberate effort every single day to say, I'm going to take religion. I'm going to take Christianity and the church and the kingdom and God's righteousness seriously. If you've ever been accused of the phrase, you take religion too seriously. I guess I could say, good for you. Jesus' family, when he was out doing miracles, he was healing folks, and some of his family said, Jesus, come, come out of there. Get out of there. And Jesus said, no. Those that do my Father's will are my brothers and sisters and mother." As we consider the importance of seeking first the kingdom of God, have you obeyed the gospel? You can't seek first the kingdom of God if you've not been added to it. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God as he so thoroughly proved throughout the gospels, throughout his life. Believe that Jesus is, Jesus is the Son of God as we see in Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. We are to repent of our sins and be baptized for the remission of sin. Confess Christ as the Son of God, Acts 8, and verse 34 through 38, and be baptized for the remission of our sins. 1 Peter 3 and 21, that our sins can be removed, that we can be saved. Maybe you've done that, and you'd like the prayers of brothers and sisters. We'd love to help with that. If you're one of either class, please come forward as we stand and sing.